Good evening. Welcome to Wex Med Live. I am Dr. Carol Bradford, Dean of the Ohio State University College of Medicine and Vice President for Health Sciences at the Wexner Medical Center. It is hard to believe that this is my fourth time hosting Wex Med Live. I always look forward to this event with my Ohio State and Wexner Medical Center colleagues, with my co-host, Dr. Peter Moeller, and with all of you. The last time we all came together, we heard about pro progressive neuroscience research in the Belford Center for Spinal Cord Injury. And this work, uh, the work being done in this center is really addressing the metabolic problems that come alongside patients suffering from spinal cord injury. And the work is really addressing those medical problems and medical, metabolic problems. We also heard from our chair of radiation oncology about how proton and flash therapy is truly advancing cancer treatments for both adults and pediatric or children patients. Um, there's so much excitement, uh, growth, and innovation happening right now at The Ohio State University. And we are truly on a trajectory that few, if any other institutions can match. I cannot wait for you to hear from our two esteemed and engaged speakers this evening. Tonight, you will hear from Dr. Brian Whitson about blending medicine and engineering to make people, particularly those patients suffering from end stage lung failure better. Our second speaker, Dr. Kyle Vancouvering, will truly amaze you with his work in 3D printing digital solutions to impact cancer care and personal patient stories. I have really had the privilege of getting to know both of these innovative, creative, fabulous uh, faculty physicians uh, here at Ohio State. But I must confess, I've had the privilege of knowing uh, Dr. Kyle Vancouvering for about 10 years, because again, I truly had the privilege in participating in his education uh, at perhaps that school up north. Both Dr. Vancouvering and Dr. Whitson lead teams of people to advance their research. People truly make the difference in everything that we are doing here at Ohio State. I want you, our advocates, our supporters, and our friends to know that you are part of the team that helps make the difference. Our philanthropic supporters empower these brilliant clinician scientists to truly tackle complex problems. Philanthropy plays a pivotal role in all of this. And on behalf of all of us at Ohio State, thank you. Now, I would like to introduce to all of you our MC for the evening. Dr. Peter Moeller is Chief Scientific Officer for The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, Vice Dean for Research uh, in the College of Medicine, and Interim Vice President for Research at The Ohio State University. Dr. Moeller will actually introduce both of our speakers this evening and then lead a brief question and answer segment near the end. Please feel free to submit your questions for that segment in the chat at any time during the event. And we will certainly be, uh, answer as many of those questions as we possibly can. Dr. Moeller. Thanks, Carol, and, um, and happy holidays. I wanna wish everyone out um, in Zoom world um, a, a really sincere happy holidays and hope everyone's um, doing well. Tonight is gonna be a, a lot of fun as it always is. Um, as many of you know, this is our 14th um, WexMed Live and our sixth virtual one. Um, we are joining you today from um, um, beautiful, sunny, 70 degree weather in Columbus, Ohio, and hope wherever you are, um, you're, you're warm and, and you're safe. Tonight is, is going to really be special, and, and it's special because we're highlighting two faculty members here within the College of Medicine 
that that really exemplify what I we we call interdisciplinary research or convergent research, bringing multiple fields together to tackle incredibly um, difficult and complex questions. And so, um, really excited to have the opportunity to introduce you to two, these two faculty. Um, as Dean Bradford mentioned, would really love for this to be as as much as possible um, um, open um, as much as we can do with Zoom. So if you do have questions, um, please put them in the chat or please put them in the question and answer and we'll get to as many um, as many of these as possible. For those of you uh, who are joining us for um, the first time, um, you'll see this is a little bit different than learning um, about normal um, scientific talks. We try to keep these short, keep them within sort of six to eight minutes so you have an opportunity to, uh, to not get too into the weeds of the science, but to really understand the exciting things that are certainly happening at Ohio State. So um, our first speaker this evening is Dr. Brian Whitson. Um, so if I could ask Brian to come to the virtual stage. Um, Dr. Whitson is both an MD and a PhD uh, with his PhD in engineering and serves as vice chair of innovation and translational research. He's co-director of what he's gonna explain to you called the Copper Laboratory and the Jewell and Frank Vincent family research um, professor. I've had the opportunity to work with Dr. Whitson for many, many years. And what you're really going to see come through is his engineering background. So um, welcome, Brian. Um, happy holidays and look forward to your talk. We'll connect right after the talk. Thanks. Why I'm here, engineering organs to make people better. How many people out there have ever gotten out of breath? Whether with running, with illness, or even climbing up the stairs. In general, for most of us, that feeling passes. But for those with end-stage cardiopulmonary failure or chronic lung diseases, imagine that's what it's like all the time. Day in, day out, you're never stopping. For those of us who don't experience this, we have no frame of reference. It's debilitating, it's terrifying, now let's imagine that you're a man named George, a middle-aged guy who's been healthy his entire life, working with machines, loving to ride his motorcycle, and he notices that things are just getting harder. He's a little short of breath. Over the next three to six months, things are worse. He goes to see his doctor, but they're not much help. Then he's huffing and puffing, walking, and then he's put on oxygen. Then he's told that he has a progressive, often fatal lung disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Told that medicines can't cure this, you only hold it at bay, and that he needs a lung transplant. There is no dialysis option. There are no mechanical pumps. Now he's put on five to eight liters of oxygen a minute, and he can hardly walk. It's a race, but he can't run anymore. He needs a cure. Traditionally, this cure has been transplantation. It's a bit ironic that we have a global supply chain problem. In transplantation, we have a shortage here too, an organ supply shortage. Let's look at this supply challenge. Over time, the demand for end-stage organ failure has dramatically increased. As a profession, we've increased the overall number of transplants to a point. For around the last decade, there have been relatively small increases in volume nationally, and this is mostly a reflection of donor organ shortage. For lungs, as an example, only around 23% of organ donors are able to have their lungs recovered for transplantation. This shortfall is what we're trying to address. Well, how do we do that? In addition to education and advocacy, one way is to make donor lungs healthier, so to speak. We're engineering organs and endothelial cells, or commonly known as blood vessel cells, to make organs better so we can help make people better. But how did I get here? To me, this is a blending of medicine and engineering. It's the true applied side of a whole bunch of basic and translational research that's gone on across the world for decades. My background is one of mechanical and biomedical engineering with a progression into surgery, cardiothoracic surgery to be more precise, and transplantation. In 2012, I was recruited to OSU to start the lung transplant program and build a translational research program. With the help of a lot of talented people, the support of our leadership, we've done both. The success is due to the synergy and aligned interest of treating end-stage lung failure in a heart hospital of all places, the Ross Heart Hospital. Some of what I'm gonna share with you are things that only seem like could be done in science fiction or at a place like Ohio State a place where we can treat patients, go to the lab to investigate what we're seeing, and then go back to the bedside again. We're doing this in two ways. 
How we're doing this is utilizing novel ways of assessing organs using normothermic ex vivo organ perfusion. This is sort of space aged, but in ex vivo perfusion, we're taking hearts and lungs and livers and kidneys outside the body and keeping them alive on miniature perfusion machines. The next slide and a few others are going to show live organs on ex vivo perfusion machines for visualization purposes. We're able to keep the organs alive, assess them and see how they're functioning. If the organ looks good and meets metrics, it can go on to save someone's life through transplantation. We're doing that now. How do we evolve the current approach to donor assessment? How do we resuscitate organs and repair them if they're damaged? One way is by treating the organ, changing the organs at a cellular level. We can deliver drugs directly to the cells to heal them and modify them, returning that organ to a healthier state. In lung transplantation, poor donor organ quality is an all too common reperfusion injury after transplantation. And this distills down to injury at the endothelial of those blood vessel cells. That injury to the blood vessel lining is in essence, leakiness. When you look at this image, the red river represents blood vessels and the light bulb, the alveolus for the air pockets in the lung. This leakiness is what we see with a lot of things, pneumonia, contusion, transfusion reactions, trauma, even COVID. Today, we're focusing on the lungs and its endothelial cell response or blood vessel lining leakiness, that red river in the image. That response to transplant reperfusion leakiness, either from within the river or from within the alveolus or that light bulb, leads to blood vessel permeability. This leakiness is every organ's response to an injury. The leakiness causes harmful inflammatory molecules, known as cytokines, to be released. We can all relate to this. This is why your ankle swells after you twist it. The ankle swells, it gets warm, it gets hard to move. In the lung, this leakiness and swelling and inflammation causes the alveolus or that light bulb to start to fill with fluid. This makes oxygenation harder and the lungs work less well, making it harder for you to breathe. Sometimes it's a little, sometimes it's a lot. We aren't always able to predict its degree, but it always happens after transplantation. At OSU, we've developed a way that we can treat and hopefully prevent this leakiness. Researchers in my lab and my collaborators' laboratories have developed novel proteins that are able to be used as drugs or medicines for these cells. We've identified important pathways of inflammation where we can intervene and stop this response. In cell culture, we can repair the damage from a lack of oxygen, also known as hypoxic injury. In transplantation, all organs are hypoxic or out of oxygen for a period of time when they're outside the body prior to transplantation. Those proteins, or medicines for the cells that I mentioned, we're able to deliver them where they can home into the cell injury and repair that cell surface or the cell membrane. In cell culture, we're able to turn off inflammatory pathways. One important pathway that we've been able to target and modulate is a pathway known as CD38. But the drugs we have to modulate CD38, they're not specific. Unfortunately, inflammation is helpful. We don't wanna turn it all off. We need to get the drug to the right type of cell and in the right location within that cell so that the drug is able to have the most effect with the least adverse reactions. We can build nanoparticles or little targeted packages to deliver the molecules of drugs where we want them to go. To stop inflammation in the cell, we wanna treat that ischemia reperfusion response when it happens at the time of transplantation. We can take potent inhibitors of the CD38 inflammatory pathway or any molecule really, package it up, coat it with antibodies that are attracted to those blood vessel cells. On the left, you see a controlled blood vessel cell culture. In the middle, you see those cells with just an antiparticle. And on the right, you see the antibody targeted antiparticle and it's concentrated very highly in those blood vessel cells, only going where we want them to go. Now we're going to deliver these nanoparticles to the organ. We need it to get into the cells before transplantation. That way the drug can prevent inflammation inside the cell where it needs to be when the hypoxia happens. We're able to specifically target the area of the organ most at risk of injury, deliver the protective and reparative drugs to where they need to be to heal the organ and improve the overall outcome from transplantation. Where are we now? Today, it's using normothermic ex vivo perfusion, and it is expanding the donor pool, letting us do more transplants for those who need them. Do you remember the gentleman that I mentioned earlier? He's George Costa. He's our first EVLP recipient at Ohio State from August of 2016. He's doing great back at what he loves, but we still have a huge unmet need. People do die on the waiting list awaiting the gift of transplantation. 
we need to make that 23% of lungs that are being able to be transplanted much, much higher. So where are we going? What's our future? I believe it's melding these two treatment concepts. What you'll see is a lung undergoing EVLP followed by a heart. We're going to be utilizing normothermic ex vivo organ perfusion to assess and resuscitate organs. Once we understand what they need, we'll deliver specific targeted drugs to repair the organ and modify it, making it better for transplantation. Clinical trials with these novel drug interventions being delivered to the organs by ex vivo perfusion are just around the corner. To do that, we'll need to utilize the unique environment OSU has, one that merges the science with the clinic. We'll need to build upon our ability to assess four organs, heart, lung, liver, and kidney in OSU's Comprehensive Transplant Center, Organ Assessment and Repair Center. We're grateful to those who have believed in the research and helped us get to where we are. Ohio Third Frontier, the OSU Wexner Medical Center, our generous donors, and the great people in the Ross. When we're able to begin these groundbreaking clinical trials, we'll be able to expand the donor organ pool, improving the organs and making them better for transplantation, safer. We're building targeted therapies that we can deliver to preserve and recover lung function, both for transplantation and lung health. Do you remember those endothelial cells? Well, they're everywhere. Imagine if we can fix endothelial cells that are not only in the lung, but the heart, the liver, kidneys, not just for transplantation, but for other inflammation injury as well. Maybe we can use these targeted therapy approaches there too. Thank you. Welcome back, Brian, to the stage. Brian, in incredible work. Um, before we move on um, to the second talk, I um, want to just ask you a couple of questions if, if I can. So, so the first is, and make sure I'm getting this the right, get, get, getting this correct, is that really it's not that there's lack of lungs available, it's that there's lack of lungs where we know that we have suitable um, ability to get them into people, and, and meaning that your technology could really get that 23% up to a significantly higher percent. Am, am I hearing that the right way? Yeah, and no, I think you've summarized it exactly right, Dr. Muller. So there are a lot of people who are organ donors. There's several reasons why sometimes you know, we can't get those lungs to transplantation. Uh, a lot of it is managing risk where you need to have the expertise of a big volume program like we have at Ohio State. The other is being able to take those organs that may have minor things wrong with them and then ensure that they're you know, they can improve or actually make them better prior to transplantation because you don't want to put an organ or we don't want to put an organ in somebody and have it not work because that would be you know, bad for all parties involved. Um, so it's really taking these technologies so we can more effectively assess them and then try to make them better prior to transplantation. And then what, what theoretically could you, could you reasonably get that 23% up to realizing that every percent represents probably hundreds of saved lives. Is that fair? Yeah, no, it's, it's very fair. I, I think going to 100 is unrealistic. You know, I think if we, you know, just doing the back of the envelope math, if we could double it and get it up to about 50%, which is very realistic, just from what I've seen in, in my experience with organ donation, that doubling of the available number of organ donors would essentially allow everybody on the waiting list to get transplanted annually. So, you know, it's, it's not, we don't need to you know, shoot for the moon. We just got to get up the up the hill. So just modest increases make huge impacts across the country. Last question, then we'll move on. Um, so clearly, um, very busy transplant surgeon, um, very busy laboratory um, uh, scientist. You know, how do you mix both worlds? And does having both worlds together at an academic medical center like the Wexner Medical Center? allow you to do both both better, if that makes sense. It does. So I think the thing that I've been able to capitalize on is all the great people that I get to work with. And so that's a little quaint sometimes, but it, it's real. It really makes it a lot easier and exciting to come to work. The other thing that's allowed us to be successful uh, is that it's aligning a vision. So what I'm doing clinically and what I'm doing in a research perspective and what we're trying to do nationally to grow all the great stuff we're doing in transplantation here at Ohio State, they're all aligned in one direction. And so that's very, it's very easy and very synergistic because everything's pointing in, in, in one area. 
um, you know, I would be remiss if I said this was, you know, all my work. So it is really working with a lot of other people and that lets us be force multipliers, both in the clinic and in the research lab. And that's really the strength of Ohio State. Well, we're, we're, we're really grateful. And I know that there's already a bunch of questions in the Q&A that we'll come back to at the end. So just a huge thank you. Um, there's a lot of people on the Zoom tonight that that um, are well because of you and your team. And so just a huge thanks to, to, to all of you and the Ross and, and all the great work you're doing. Thank you, sir. So um, excited to move on to our second speaker. Um, our next presenter is Kyle Vancouvering. Um, Kyle has a lot of, of titles that I'm going to go through very quickly. So he's the assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and Skull-Based Surgery in the College of Medicine. And this is one of the best departments in the world um, uh, led by Dr. Jim Rocco. So um, really incredible work in, in this group. Director and PI of Medical Modeling, Materials and Manufacturing Lab, and Director of Clinical Engineering at the Ohio State School of Engineering, Center of Design and Manufacturing Excellence. So that's certainly a, a mouthful. Um, before we um, get into the talk today, I, I, we noticed that um, Dean Bradford, who's both of our bosses, um, mentioned that um, you had um, typically or previously worked with her at um, a certain school up north. Um, and I know you don't wanna say anything in front of a, a big audience about how Ohio State is the superior university in multiple ways. Um, so perhaps maybe during your talk, if you could do something subtle like wink or maybe take a sip of water to acknowledge that Ohio State is the superior place, um, that would be super. So um, we'll come back and get some questions from you at the end. So we'll go ahead and give the talk. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Bradford and Dr. Muller for giving me the opportunity to speak with all of you today. It is such an honor to be able to discuss my passions for engineering and medicine. I wanna start with a story of a patient. Randy was 58 years old when he was diagnosed with cancer of the voice box. He went through several rounds of treatment, but the cancer kept returning. And eventually the only option was to remove the entire voice box and upper breastbone. In spite of all of this, his cancer returned yet again. And he was started on immunotherapy and finally a glimmer of hope as the tumor began to shrink away. And yet as his optimism grew for the cancer treatment, the opening of his windpipe began to shrink from all of the scar tissue and surgery and radiation. Over several months, it became harder and harder to breathe. Eventually, he was in and out of the emergency room several times with life-threatening blockages. There was no good option for him to keep his airway open. So he was left sticking a tube just like this down his windpipe every two hours to stretch it back open. In spite of the fact that his cancer had now disappeared, he was actually in worse shape. Tied to this dilation tube, unable to leave the house or do any activities, waiting for the next moment when his breathing would be cut off completely. Marcus Aurelius, the great Roman emperor once said, when you arise in the morning, think of what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, to love. I really love this quote because how many of us ever think about something as simple as breathing? But for Randy, this was all he thought about. How difficult will the next breath be? Will it be enough? My name is Kyle Vancouvering. I'm a head and neck cancer surgeon with specialized expertise in treating tumors of the skull base between the nose, eyes, and brain. But before going to medical school, my background was in biomedical engineering, and I've always been passionate about finding a way to bring engineering and medicine together. It is my personality as a surgeon to see immediate results, to see a cancer or a deformity in a patient, to perform an operation and see them cured at the end of the procedure. As an engineer and a researcher, I was similarly motivated to find translatable ways to bring engineered solutions directly to patients. That is, to see a patient with a unique problem, engineer a solution, and to be able to deliver it to that patient. And that's why I became so passionate about, of all things, 3D printing. 
My guess is that most of you have at least heard about 3D printing and may have even seen a 3D printer somewhere. But why are we talking about 3D printing in medicine? 3D printing is a relatively new manufacturing technique. The process is almost entirely digital, and the overall concept is relatively simple. Let's say you want to create an object, perhaps a coffee mug. You would first start with a digital design for this coffee mug, a 3D model. Next, you would take this 3D object and slice it into hundreds of very thin 2D layers. The coordinates of each of these 2D layers is then sent to the printer, and the printer deposits a thin layer of material following the design of the initial 2D pattern. The printer elevates and then deposits the material on top of this first layer, following the design of the second layer. This process repeats until layer by layer, the final product is complete. <clears throat> Now, many of us may be familiar with hobbyist 3D printing, but in medicine, this layered building technique allows for nearly infinite geometries to be created. And the digital workflow means that the design of each print can be different for every patient. This means personalized medicine. The idea that we could take a CAT scan or an MRI and then digitally build an exact model of the patient's anatomy or tumor geometry and then create a product that is perfectly customized to that one patient, all within hours. One of the areas we've seen 3D modeling and printing really expand in recent years is a process called digital surgical planning. This idea that we can digitally execute a surgery from an exact 3D model of a patient's anatomy. And then using that digital blueprint, we can 3D print surgical models, guides, and even customized plates to assist the surgeon in executing the surgery and the reconstruction. Over the last five to 10 years, we've seen that these digitally planned operations appear to have better outcomes, reduced time in the operating room, fewer complications, better reconstructions. However, it's expensive. And right now, this technology is really only accessible through commercial companies. This means that the engineering is done halfway across the country, requiring extra time for design, production, shipping, and delivery, and really limiting this technology's availability to many of our patients. I moved to Ohio State just over a year ago, and a big part of the reason that I took a position here was the opportunity to build a medical engineering center. With a world-class educational institution, a nationally recognized engineering school, and clinically outstanding medical center, why couldn't we build those same capabilities right here at OSU? So that's what we've set off to do over the last year. We've created a medical 3D modeling lab. And through this, we've made over 50 models for patients undergoing tumor removal and reconstructive surgery, including tumors of the jaw, orbit or eye socket and reconstruction in tumors of the lower leg. But the potential here is endless as we aim to assist with surgical procedures across the entire body. The vision is to build a 3D printing and medical manufacturing center with the right controls to make our own custom implants and do our own innovative engineering right here at the point of care. This will allow us to turn a design or implant into a final product for a patient, potentially within days and at a fraction of the cost. This would revolutionize personalized medical device manufacturing. And we are thrilled to actually be partnering with some of those same industry leaders to help bring this technology right to the hospital. So our surgeons, and engineers are sitting shoulder to shoulder and the products are being made on site. So what does this look like in 10 years? Today, we're making static models and guides, improving surgical orientation and optimizing reconstructive alignment. But this transition to an in-house 3D printing program needs to be prospectively studied, validating both the clinical and the financial impact. As we build the resources of an innovation center and manufacturing capacity, we will soon be able to manufacture our own patient-specific implants in-house, and ultimately, pioneering cancer therapy through personalized reconstructive scaffolds with integrated therapies like chemotherapy or radiation. Engineering on a macro scale, the goal is to move manufacturing to the bedside and redefine the standard of care by offering personalized devices and solutions right here at OSU. 
whether it be a cancer reconstruction or a customized drug delivery tool, a bioengineered organ, or a personalized prosthetic. The goal is to take ideas and mature them into fully tested, clinically validated products in-house with our own manufacturing capability. Before closing out, I wanted to circle back to Randy's story. With our 3D printing capacity, we were able to use a CAT scan of his chest to map out the shape of his airway. We then designed a customized tube to help stent open his windpipe and perfectly shaped this to his anatomy. We then 3D printed a mold and filled it with medical grade silicone. And with the right FDA clearances, we were able to place this into his trachea. And I'm happy to report that this tube has dramatically changed his quality of life. He no longer has airway obstruction and he's returned to hobby work as a mechanic. He's able to leave the house without fear for each breath. And he continues to be cancer free. So just imagine you need a major procedure someday. And we have a 3D printing center right here next to the operating room, creating models, guides, and implants in real time to improve your outcomes. Whether that be a better chance to beat the cancer or get back on the golf course sooner, or even something as fundamental as being able to breathe. I'm grateful to the donors and other investors who have already helped us reimagine the standard of care and surgical planning. Yet building a comprehensive 3D printing center like this is a big vision. Reflecting on our progress over the past year, it has been such a privilege to be at such a supportive institution. And I'm so thankful for our incredible team. We are already well into the first phases of this process. And we invite you to partner with us on this journey and participate in this vision to engineer at the point of care. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Really incredible work, Kyle. Congratulations to you as, as well as your colleagues, both in the College of Medicine, I would say also at the, the College of Engineering. I also hope you enjoyed your um, your glass of water. So um, before um, we ask, <laughs> before we, we move forward, um, help me help us all visualize this a little bit but a little bit better. So patient comes into the James, you know, needs um, needs needs something quickly. Walk us through the actual work chain of 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 how it would be identified, where it would be printed, and how quickly it could yeah. be put back into the patient. Absolutely. So, you know, the idea is a patient would come in, let's say with a tumor. Uh, so I'll give you an example here. Here's a, can you guys see this? Okay. Yeah. With the background. Uh, this is a, a mandible or a lower jaw bone. You can see here where the tumor has eaten away a big portion of the jaw. And so the idea is that we could take that patient's CAT scan from the day they show up and using our modeling algorithm, we can actually rebuild a full exact model of what their jaw bone looks like. And then with digital planning, we could actually design exactly where we would need to make the cuts to get rid of the cancer. So we could plan out where those cuts are made. We could even make uh, and design a little template or guide that would help the surgeon line all this up. And at the end, the idea is to be able to create a custom plate or a reconstructive scaffold. So as we're putting the patient back together, we know that whether it be bone we took from somewhere else in the body or a 3D printed scaffold or a customized plate, as we pull all this back together, the teeth line up exactly, or the leg is exactly the right length, or the arm position is exactly right so that their function can be optimized. And by pre-planning all of that, we can try and optimize that workflow. And so what that looks like practically is we're talking about a process that right now commercially takes weeks, maybe even a month. And for a lot of our patients, we don't have that time to wait. And if we can move all of those workflows in-house, the data is protected and the opportunity there is to turn that around in a matter of days. So we've got uh, a space at the hospital where we could be working directly with the clinicians, engineers on site, designing together, oh, I want to put a screw right here, or I want to design the plate just like this and looking at the screen and pointing together. And then we'll, we would ideally have this manufacturing center on campus that would allow us to create those products and turn them around and get them delivered to our patients right away. That's, it's, it's really incredible. And it really sounds like what you're talking about is certainly a lot of people involved, but, but really artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us design these better. Is that, is that a fair statement? That's, yeah, that's exactly right. So one of the many components, so A, as you mentioned, um, and has been highlighted several times, both by Dr. Whitson and Dean Bradford, the people here have been phenomenal. So I've 
been able to partner with some incredible people on the engineering side uh, through the Center for Design and Manufacturing Excellence and the Institute for Materials Research. And we've got an incredible team that's come together and it's been a great blend of medicine and engineering working collaboratively. Um, and, and the other part is one of these, one of these, uh, one of the great visions here is that we want to be able to turn this around, not just in a matter of days, but we want to continue to shorten that to hours. And probably the best way to do that is to automate as much of this workflow as possible. So right now we have students who are doing a bunch of manual processing in that digital pathway. And if we can use machine learning and some artificial intelligence to automate that workflow, we can then turn that around as in a matter of hours instead. That's in, that's incredible. One of the one of the really special things about your department, and and you know this as well as as well as certainly Dean Bradford and with her background is is that you study both cancer and non-cancer. So you'll interact with patients right. in really all worlds in in otolaryngology. Can you've talked a little bit about how this application can be used for cancer? Can you expand sort of the future of how this could be used in non forms of non-cancer? Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, the easiest way to think about it is in the surgical world, but I think it expands well beyond that. So some other examples, let's think about somebody with a severe spinal scoliosis or curvature of the spine. Straightening the spine is a really complicated procedure and it requires a lot of planning and thought about how you're going to try and move and orient and make some cuts and, and bring rods in. So this is something where we could actually model a lot of that out uh, or chest wall deformities. Um, and then even thinking outside of surgery and reconstruction, uh, thinking about things like uh, patients who are undergoing radiation treatment. There are certain organs or parts of the body that are critical to shield from getting too much radiation, uh, but it's very hard. And right now, the way we do this is a very clunky sort of beanbag lead shield that you wear over your body, which has really no precision. But we could use this same technology to create a customized shield that perfectly fits that patient so they're oriented in exactly the right geometry so that radiation is delivered precisely to where it needs to go and is protected from areas where it doesn't need to go. Oh, that's great. So um, would love if we could um, welcome back our other um, guests to the stage and we're gonna open it up for a little bit of, of Q&A. Great, uh, as always, great, great talk and, and thanks for, for, for all the great work. So um, welcome back Dean Bradford, welcome back um, Dr. Whitson. Um, I want to go first um, to you, Dr. Woodson, if you don't mind. Um, tonight, we've heard about um, science and really applied um, innovations that, that you know, five years ago, we never even thought about. And, and today, they're happening in real time at the Wexner Medical Center. A lot of those same levels of innovations um, may not be... Um, uh, ready to be funded by a, a group like the NSF or the National Institutes of Health. Can you, can you, Brian, talk a little bit about how um, support from, from, from Ohio State philanthropic community has allowed you to get to where you are today and, and not just you, but your team? Yeah, no, I'm happy to, Dr. Moeller. You know, for us, and particularly starting our, our Copper Lab, which is a grouping of people aligned around organ perfusion um, in the transplant center, it was built off the basis of philanthropy. You know, we started, and you've got a great slide of this, you know, it's an empty room with bare bones in Weissman Hall, but through a, a very generous gift from Tom Fleisch, we were able to, and with your support and, and, and Bob Higgins at the time, uh, to be able to get initial research equipment and, and start that. And that's where we were able to begin. And that's led to two NIH funded investigators in that lab. You know, translating that over into the clinical world, getting our heart ex vivo perfusion would not have been possible without a generous gift from Brian Williamson. Uh, my research is funded and supported through the, the Benson Chair, and uh, Frank and Jewel have been phenomenal supporters of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis research and also what we're doing. And the, the growth and the, the network that Dan Leidy and his foundation are putting together to carry these things on in the Ross are, are going to be instrumental for paying that forward to other researchers. So the philanthropic contributions, you know, without them, we wouldn't be there, at least around this type of work at, at OSU. Yeah, and I would just just add to that, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's the holidays and really grateful that, you know, a lot of the discoveries that we've seen, you know, at Ohio State, um, whether it's in the medical center or across the whole university, just very grateful to the, you know, the, the you know, Buckeye Nation that's, that's really allowing us to do these, um, to do these special things. Um, Dean Bradford, you know, you've been at Ohio State um, now about 18 months. Um, can you talk as 
as both a surgeon and a scientist, you know, the impact of, you know, bringing together teams that are in engineering, we've heard great, you know, great collaborations tonight, you know, really how that can allow us to move much faster and how that might be different at a normal medical center than an academic medical center. So, so thank you. And I also want to thank our presenters, uh, grateful for all the people participating tonight uh, and thank everybody for their support. And of course, happy ho holidays to everyone. So, I mean, as I was reflecting on these two incredible, incredible talks we've heard tonight, I mean, what's really special about medicine and engineering uh, here at The Ohio State University, we really have a very strong medical school, Wexner Medical Center, and an incredibly strong College of Engineering. And when you think about how, um, and again, we have two physicians, scientists who are also engineers. Um, I, I do not have an engineering degree. My background is in science, but I have a husband and a son who are engineers. But really, engineering brings technology to the forefront to create novel solutions for the, the you know some of medicine's most difficult challenges. So uh, uh, lung uh, lungs not working, inability to breathe, uh, and cancer. So really, two life threatening, clearly life threatening conditions, where the partnership and brilliance I will add of and combining engineering solutions to medical. Uh, conditions and putting that together in really unique, interesting, innovative, and creative ways is really transformative. And so to be have a top-tier academic medical center on a top-tier university campus with a, a, a top-tier college of engineering right on the same campus makes all of that possible. And it, and it really um, sets the table for a lot of the big things that are happening across OI State. I'm thinking about the interdisciplinary research facility that is really going to house teams like Kyle's and Brian's together with engineers to be able to do a lot of these things in real time. Absolutely. And I hope members of our audience have the chance to drive by um, that building. I get goosebumps every time I drive by just thinking all the about all of the innovation and transformation about bringing really biomedical discoveries to transform care of our patients and all patients. So I um, would remind um, folks in the audience to please um, add your questions to the Q&A. Um, we'll start with you, um, Dr. Whitson. Um, had a question, um, we, 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 we asked Dr. Vancouvering the same question. Um, how can your same technology apply to um, the non-pulmonary system, so non-lungs. And I know that you have a great partner that you're working with in some, some, some projects today. Yeah, it's a, I think that's a really good question also, Dr. Moeller. It's really organ agnostic. So these vessel, these blood vessel lining cells, they're throughout the body. So things that we're doing to some degree are lung specific, if it needs a ventilator, that particular apparatus, but the blood vessel lining cells are, are everywhere. So whether that's lung or liver or heart or kidney or even potentially other areas of non-transplant uh, inflammation, it's, it's really wherever those blood vessel lining cells are or any cell that we you know, choose to target those nanoparticles to. So blood vessel linings are, are where we are. One of my very close collaborators, collaborators and close friends, Sylvester Black, is doing very similar things in liver transplantation, though he's looking more at the cells that help uh, you know, clear the toxins in our, in our blood and, and make proteins. So they're uh, you know, slightly different, but the, the concept is, doesn't matter the organ, it's, it's more targeting things at a cellular level, which I think is the, the cool part. That's great. And a follow-up to that, we have a very bright um, audience out here tonight. Um, um, could you, you, you talked about taking a, you know, an unusable organ and making it usable. Could you take a good organ and make it sort of a super organ or an excellent organ? Uh, I think so. I think a lot of it depends on what's, what's the barrier to overcome. You know, some of this requires time. And so these are things where we're working very closely with our, our collaborators in engineering and medicinal chemistry. 
because we need to find ways to keep these organs alive for a period of time because it, things need to, to work. And we have to do this at body temperature so that the proteins and the enzymes are able to be effective. It won't work on ice or things in the cooler. So we need to work on novel blood substitutes so we can keep the, the organ perfused and have enough oxygen. Uh, you know, we're working very closely with people like you know, Blake Peterson, medicinal chemistry, which is a, a cross collaboration across colleges to develop these new drugs that are more specific. So uh, yes, I think to answer your question, we can, uh, but it's, it's really where we start to pull from different fields, uh, pulling in the engineers and the, the medicinal chemists to try to do these. That's incredible. Um, uh, move to Dr. Vancouvering. Um, we have a question from one of our audience members. Could an ear implant be made for people who cannot fly and the tubes are not successful for managing pressure changes? Quite possibly, yeah. Uh, so there's there's several different avenues to manage those pressure changes, especially for people who are going up, you know, in airplanes or scuba divers and things along those lines. Um, and using some of that design work and custom modeling, we could certainly look at it anatomically. What's the reason that those pressure changes are problematic? Um, at the end of the day, you know, the, the idea is there's dysfunction in what's called the eustachian tube, which is the normal tube that sort of ventilates that ear space and it's quite possible we could design a customized tube that actually sends open that eustachian tube and helps it ventilate. And I think, I think you know, that's certainly a realistic opportunity there. That's incredible, that's great. So I'm gonna turn the, uh, the, the, the question back to Dean Bradford. And, and we've heard a lot, of, a lot about incredible science tonight, great innovation, great teamwork. Within the College of Medicine um, at The Ohio State University, you know, you've been around 18 months. We've seen a lot of growth, a lot of changes, both in the research mission, as well as the education mission. And, you know, a lot of the new efforts are to bring together not only scientists from different areas, but also learners from different areas. Um, can you update us on some of the sort of the exciting things that are happening in the education uh, mission at Ohio State? Uh, absolutely, and it's really been a, a great uh, joy and privilege to serve as the dean here for nearly uh, a year and a half. So, really, we're really um, we really believe that education of the future clinicians and scientists and leaders uh, is is a primary mission uh, uh, and ambition of our College of Medicine. What I think we are truly leading the way in is in interprofessional, interdisciplinary, bringing uh, people from different fields, different perspectives, like engineering and medicine or other health professions or uh, sociologists, uh, public health professionals, you name it, uh, together because that diversity of background and thinking, bringing those teams together really enhances science, uh, care, and uh, actually education itself. It'll really allow us to tackle our society's most challenging problems. And so uh, a building uh, not far from where I'm sitting this evening is the um, Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Building. And that will really be the future of interdisciplinary, interprofessional uh, education, um, which really is uh, the future of education because at patient's bedside and in the research laboratory, teams of people uh, need to come together and do come together to provide the very, very best care. And again, as we've heard tonight, that's really how science is performed today. It's, it's, it's truly exciting. It's a, it's a great time um, to be at Ohio State. Um, I'll turn it over to our two speakers. Um, you know, you've both been at Ohio State for, for varying amounts of time. You know, when you look at the teams that, that you've been on, what would you say you're the most proud of, you know, 2021 going into 2022? You know, we've learned a lot during the, during the pandemic about working together. Um, what do you most look forward to next year? Um, maybe start with Dr. Vancouver. Yeah, so for me, it's clearly the innovation and the excitement that bringing teams from different backgrounds together really sparks. Uh, I, I want to give you a, a quick example. I think, you know, Dean Bradford, you're already kind of highlighting this a little bit, but we sponsor a, a project through one of the engineering capstone classes. It's like, here's a problem for facial edema that we don't have a great solution for. And the way we've always managed swelling in the face is to just put pressure on it, to push the fluid to other places. And 
I think for my entire medical career, I've figured it was a pressure fluid management problem. And so we sent the engineering students off on this idea to, okay, how would you design a customized pressure device to maybe use some 3D printing or modeling or whatever? And they took it one step further. And it, was, it just blew my mind to, to meet with them just four weeks later. And they said, well, yeah, so we know the pressure stuff, but what about ultrasonic waves and then using thermal gradients to actually drive fluid movement? And I was, it just blew my mind because these were concepts that, yeah, of course that actually could work. And we think about that in medicine and other areas, but, but don't you just push the fluid out? Isn't that how we, well, and it just completely opened the box of, we got to be thinking about these problems completely differently. And this idea that when you bring people who, you know, honestly, they don't have a lot of medical background per se, and that's the brilliance and the beauty of it, because they're not constrained to the conventional thinking that we all get as clinicians and researchers in medicine. And that's where I think the real beauty. And so seeing this innovation spark come from our team, and I, I've got, you know, several more examples, uh, and even the young clinicians that are working with us in the lab see a problem in the clinic. It's a patient I've never seen. And they say, I think we can make a solution for that. And I just love to see that momentum carrying on. That's great. Dr. Woodson? That's a tough one, Dr. Moeller. I, I, I think the, I think we're going to see great things. You know, it's it's kind of like a pressure cooker that I've seen over my nine years that, that have been here. And, and I mentioned a lot of this, you know, alignment of, of vision earlier about the success we've had. But getting everybody together, the, the co-localization that we're starting to see, particularly around innovation, is, as Dr. Vancouver mentioned, and the, the catalyst that that's going to spring, I think we're going to see stuff popping up in, you know, in, in, all, in all facets. And so the, the emphasis that you and Dean Bradford have put over the last several years around bringing innovation and getting these like-minded individuals together, I, I think they're really going to start seeing fruits of that, that labor. And so there's a there's a buzz around campus and around the country really about the things that are going on in Ohio State that has really have only seen tick up in the last couple of years. And so the landscape that is currently at OSU, particularly on the, the medical center campus, this is nothing like what it was in 2011 when I was recruited here. And so, I mean, we're in a, you know, light years different from there from a physical plant. And I, I think we're going to start seeing the intellectual discoveries and contributions to science and medicine really, you know, blossom and, and partly focused around innovation with the new physical plan and all these people that you all are recruiting. That's ex it's exciting. Um, last question before I get to my normal final question. Um, the cup, the fish cup that um, Dr. Vancouvering was literally chugging water out of the whole evening. Um, did you make that yourself? Yeah, we, uh, well, we, I will say we made it, yep, in the lab, uh, but in full disclosure, we actually have, you know, an incredible team of students and researchers across the spectrum, and one of my students actually knew my passion for, for fishing and sort of integrated that into the design. Let's, let's finish with um, my favorite question um, that I like to ask each time, as, as we think forward um, to the future of the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center and the College of Medicine, um, one word that you would use to describe, you know, how you're feeling about, about the world these days and um, start with you, Dr. Whitson. One word I'd say excited. Dr. Vancouvering. Inspiring. And Dean Bradford. Um, Dr. Dr. Vancouvering picked my word in, inspired <laughs> and inspiring was mine also. We, we've, we've spent a little, a little time together. <laughs> yep. So we heard. <laughs> so um, I want to thank our presenters tonight. Um, if you have friends or colleagues that are interested in um, hearing more about what's happening in, in, in both these laboratories, please feel, reach, feel free to reach out. Um, these will also be posted online so you can watch and, and learn a little bit more about what's happening in Ohio State. Um, I want to thank everyone for being on the, on the Zoom tonight. Um, we are so, so grateful for the support that allows us to do the science that we're doing, the educational programs that are happening at Ohio State. None of these would happen without the generous support of, 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 the, of the folks on the call tonight. Um, as we close out tonight, I've been asked to um, remind everyone that we will continue to, to do these. Um, we very much look forward to getting back to doing these in person, but um, as we know, there's um, a certain thing happening. And, and so we'll likely host another one of these in spring 
of 2022. So please look forward to that. Um, and as tonight program closes out, a short survey will pop up and would ask you um, to participate in the survey because it allows us to shape um, to shape this for the future. So I um, want to thank you all again um, for, for being here tonight. Happy holidays. Um, be safe and be well. And good night.